my wife and I went to like a really fancy restaurant this last weekend and she was talking about the demographics. She's like, it's all rich liberals. She was like the true enemy. Hi, welcome to Royal Path, where we ask the hard questions. What is your guys' favorite movie from the 90s? Okay, so so here's so here's the deal. <laughs> is is it about what's the best movie from the 90s? Because that's that's pulp yeah. fiction. Well, that's pulp I mean, fiction. But my my favorite movie is the fifth element. Those are both very good. We did kind of get into some territory last week about like what movie felt like it was from that era, from the 80s and what one just was technically from the 80s. And Cyprian, those both are very, very good answers. But the correct answer is the movie that feels the most like the 90s to me is Fight Club. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. Yeah, Pixies mm. at the end, you got the whole general angst. You've got like the whole talk about like a genera like generational malaise. Like that to me feels like the '90s to me, but you know that's not my favorite movie from the '90s though. Go ahead. I don't know what my favorite movie from the '90s is. I'm just sitting here thinking about it. I mean, by the way, if you're gonna pick best movies of the '90s, like I think there's very few people that will argue with Fight Club. Just like I think there are very few people that will argue with Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Like, when did Matrix come out? Oh, 2000. Yeah, it's 2000. <laughs> But that is by far the movie of the 2000s. There's no question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm I'm showing my hand, you know, but I'm I'm just like an old death rocker at heart. Like I, I just I don't know. It's a it's a mix up between um, Lost Boys. Do it for Johnny. What year was Lost Boys? Wait, is that, that 90s or 80s? Is that late 80s? My uh, Lost Boys is 90s, isn't I it? Think we're gonna have to, it? I think we're going to have to check. I think uh -oh. have to go to the. See, I'm, I'm dating myself. Oh, <laughs> I think we're going to have to fact check you on that. Let's see. What is that? It, it may be 88. I'm going to say 88. Yeah. It's probably 88. 87. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the crow. What about the crow? The crow's a good one. I think that's nineties. That's I'm almost positive. I'm almost. Yeah, yeah. Stunt Yeah, yeah. Stunt Tipple Pie is the soundtrack on that. That's, that's yeah. That's a great one. It's a good one. Crow's a good one. What about you, Nikolai? Well, I don't. Man, it's tough, but certainly not the best. Well, when did the Burbs come out? <laughs> oh, the burbs with Tom yeah, Hanks? Gotta be 80s. Yeah. Gotta be 80s. That's yes, a great that's, that's, 80s. that's a really it, good one too. Like in yeah. a it, it was way. it's only like when I moved when I was 10 to a different county and I had no friends, I watched the burbs over and over and over and over. But other than that, I would maybe have to say Terminator 2. Terminator 2 is a fantastic movie. Terminator 2 is pretty good. Guns and Roses and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it is really good, and it's and it's also feels very nineties. Yeah. The yeah. the 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 sequels Who's... that spanned from eighty, like where you had the eighties thing, and then you went into the nineties with the sequel. Yeah. Did you guys ever read up on Terminator lore that happens after Judgment Day, like T three, no. and then all those like new ones with their? It gets buck wild. It's like eventually time travel mm. they end up like skynet's not a thing anymore it's called like legion or something it's everything's different where does this is is this what is this novels it's like t3 books where does Genesis, this come from where does the lore come from it's like that movie of christian bale and then like t3 came out yeah, yeah, yeah. and then uh i don't know there's like there's like a couple of them i tried i was like I was on lunch at work or something. I was like, oh, it's like 
the entire Terminator saga explained in 15 minutes. I was like, I'll check this out. Why not? And then at a certain point, I was like, I don't get anything. And then Sarah Connor came back, but it's like, it's like a her John Connor died. Anyway, that's not that's not what's really <laughs> that's certainly what we're not gonna talk about, but um I don't Cyprian, what was your answer? Yours was uh, I said the the fifth element, man. Oh man, the fifth element is so good. My gosh, I got my aunt a multi-pass, like a, a replica Lino, multi-pass. Lino Dallas multi-pass. Yeah, Lino multi-pass, Dallas. multi-pass. Dallas Corbin. Um, <laughs> all right, so welcome to Royal Path. My name is Andrew. Um, I'm your host, but I was thinking we had talked a little bit about maybe breaking format a little bit tonight because we have a guest with us, Nikolai, who is Father Turbo's uh, godson from California. So uh, we actually thought it'd be kind of cool to just sit and kind of talk with him for a little while. We'll get back to the creed next week. It's not going anywhere. So I figured that we'd uh, we'd sit and talk with Nikolai for a little bit. And um, it, it probably has something to do with the creed, right? Like I believe in one God. Yeah. I mean, it's all there. It's all there. <laughs> it's all there. But a roundabout way. <laughs> So what's going on, Nikolai? Why are you in town and what's going on? I'm here. I'm, I'm visiting father. I'm in his studio. Um, yeah, just here for a few days visiting Missouri. That's right. The correct way of saying it. Uh, is St. that the Mary's correct way of saying it? It is. Church. Yeah, St. Mary just, yeah, we had a whole thing. Like it is apparently. Yeah. So yeah, it's just here. Uh, here, Father Turbo and I, we've known each other for Uh, 12 years 13 and uh, yeah I met him shortly after coming in contact with orthodoxy after spending some time in a Hindu temple for uh, about 12 years so there you when have. you say spending time in a Hindu temple what does spending mm-hmm. time in it does does that mean living in a temple what is that can yeah you, can you expand on that a little yeah yeah bit? that means that means living in a temple so when I was 19 uh i kind of was on a search uh i had done all kinds of nonsense as a teenager and uh was going through a lot of difficulty so i started just kind of seeking and i didn't have any sort of christian background whatsoever so the first thing i kind of gravitated towards was buddhism and eventually uh, hinduism and i found some people who lived in a krishna temple and i met them on a street and there was a local temple nearby and i went there and uh gosh a month two later I was living there i for 12 years or stint it, living actually in kansas for a year so yeah okay. that's what i mean by being around the temple yeah literally yeah. living there yeah. yeah and then how did you how did you have an encounter with orthodoxy what was that uh that was that was in kansas so when i was 27 i came to kansas and uh i heard about a person that lived in the temples same kind of like organization that i did who had become a christian and um like a protestant i was no he became orthodox oh okay right on and so so I can, I, I guess I can step back a little bit. When, when 524 started reading, I, I, I read a biography of St. Francis and that was kind of the first time it was like, oh, there's, there's Christianity outside of like evangelical American Christianity. I really didn't know. Yeah. And um, shortly thereafter, I read The Way of the Pilgrim. And um, so when I kind of found out about this person, I was kind of getting tired of the temple at the same time, like I was having some doubts having some issues so when i heard about him i just kind of seeked him out and i found a little orthodox storefront and uh that kind of kicked it off i met him and he just really showed me the ropes and it was like wow that that was it you know that was super wild but um yeah so you know there was some back and forth that wasn't it I, i came in contact with orthodoxy but then i kind of went back into hinduism and 
and there was this kind of like tussling back and forth for some years actually um and so yeah it's been a it's been a long journey since then so yeah what was the what, what was the source of disillusionment if you could i mean if you feel comfortable talking about it with the with the hindu with you said that you were starting to feel yeah a well disillusioned. um yeah, well, there was also like, there was issues with like management, you know, I didn't get along with everybody at the temple. So there was that I was young, I was also trying to be sort of like a celibate monk type, you know, I was trying to do that. And I was terrible at it. And it, there wasn't the environment wasn't really there very conducive for like being a monk. So it was a it was just a hard, it was a hard situation. Um, I eventually got married. Um, went through kind of a difficult marriage, um, but um, I was just kind of, I was sick of it all. I was, it was, it was a hard life for <laughs> sticking myself in a temple, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. You know, I was just kind of like, I was, I was fried for lack of a better term. Well, do you mind if I ask what your very first time coming from Hinduism cold into Christianity, into orthodoxy, was that difficult? Were there things, obviously there are probably some things that were like hard to reconcile with what you were believing at the time, but was there like, I guess, what was that experience like the first time you were like in a church and experienced a service? From a Hindu. The first time was mystical. Yeah, if it was mystical because I did. I don't have, or I didn't have the hangups that like a, a somebody from Protestantism would, would have with an Orthodox church. So iconography, incense, the mother of God, saints, that was all like, I was on board, you know, there was no hiccups there whatsoever. The biggest, uh, the biggest things I think, think that are a hiccup to anybody coming from the far east would be exclusivism on the other side as well. They just don't like that you're exclusive of Christ. <laughs> but um, I think that was probably the hardest thing. I didn't understand what you said. You broke up a little bit. Sorry. The exclusive. Uh, yeah. So ex exclusivity was the biggest probably hiccup. And I think anybody coming from the Far East, sure. that's going right. to be the biggest hiccup. But, you know, as we could probably get into, exclusivity is on the other side as well. It's just that you're not allowed to have exclusivity with Christ. You know, Jesus is not okay to be exclusive about, but Hinduism is okay to be exclusive about. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But those, that's probably the biggest hiccup. You know, the biggest hiccup is like, you know, God worked in a certain way. It's not God that works in many, many, many ways. It's, it's, it's God came to the world and he worked in this way. And um, so that was difficult. Um, ideas about reincarnation is another one, you know, reincarnation is a strong one for people from the Far East, you know, they have a very like logical understanding of how it's all working. And when you hear about like resurrection body, that's I mean, that's totally foreign to, you know, the Far East. Um, yeah, yeah. To me. So when did you meet father? I met father when I was 28. So I was in, I was in Kansas for a year. And when I, when I came back uh, to California, I had looked for a church and um, one of my friends had told me about uh, uh, going to St. Barnabas and about, uh, Father Turbo and uh, Father John, now Father John, who was the, the, uh, the, the guy involved with the death to the world zines. So I went to the church there. Um, and met everybody, met Father on, a, on, the, on my first day. And, um, and yeah, so that was my tussle. So I, 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 when coming back, I went to the church for a while and I got pulled back into the Krishna scene. And you know, I, I was always, it was always like, you could just move back in the temple. It was like, life was easier that way for me, for sure. So that was a pull, but um, I definitely got pulled back into Hinduism, um, eventually going back to orthodoxy, kind of, you know, making my way back and getting baptized. And then after that, leaving again. And so there's, there's been this like tussle back and forth for sure. Um, yeah. This was in, this was in South Orange County that this is taking place. 
yeah um, yeah because yeah. i remember i remember being there and i recall always encountering like krishna types in like laguna beach and all. it seems like there's a <laughs> it's strong uh yeah there that's where like the temple good. is that's where Got the it. temple is yeah okay guys specifically laguna beach was like Man, yeah. these people are everywhere and they got one of my <laughs> they got one of my buddies that i grew up yeah. with uh they were like hey you hear about james he's the higher christian and now i was like really this james like really okay well, all right but they were like yeah he's out yeah. there in laguna beach yeah, that's basically that's exactly what happened to me <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay. that's what happened to me my friends were like well uh, he disappeared he's gone you know and yeah he was literally gone for like a decade you know went to india and yeah, did the whole uh, life, did the whole lifestyle. So what's like um, what's like a a what's like a uh, what's the word I want to look for? I guess theological, but I don't know if that's usually the correct word I want to use. What's up with the Hare Krishna? Not like their fundamentals, but like how, as like in the light of the truth of Christ, what are the Hare Krishna? Like, not like the Wikipedia page, but like the the priestopedia page, the Wiki priest page, <laughs> something like that. Wikipristia. Wikipristia. Wiki um, well, well, it's interesting because I, I think in some regards, in, in many regards, I mean, Nikolai would be able to answer that better to some degree, but I'll tell you on my end, the, the problem that, um, that I've seen over and over again, um, just with Hinduism in general, of kind of like the larger umbrella, and there's all the subsets underneath it, but just in general, is that it's it's so syncretic. It, it it has no problem taking in anything for the most part. Um, and oh, really, I'm sorry. What does syncretic mean? Basically, allowing every system, every god, every every means of understanding God, approaching God, kind of can fit in somewhere. Yeah. You could be a Hindu and say you work and worship Christ, and it's like right. cool, right? <laughs> right. It's like, um, I don't know. <laughs> forgive me for it. it it's like uh, the X Men fought this guy back in the first issues, like the mimic, or just can be. It can like change and do everything. It's super. It's super difficult to deal with. Um, and you know, I, I I know a couple guys you know, on top of Nikolai, who, um, you know, one guy in particular, same thing, has an, has an awareness of orthodoxy, would say he has a level of orthodoxy, but it's just very difficult because the, the, the absolute and exclusive claims of Christ, he just, he really struggles with. Um, and that's what you find con consistently. More importantly, it gets really difficult because for us, we, we want to hit like kind of center in on this on the, the oneness of god um and for for them they'll be like yeah you know i'm a monotheist too right i believe in the i believe in the oneness of god and then someone who's not aware of it they'll be like no you don't you have these myriads and like well actually you know and then once you get into it the person if you don't know if you don't have some measure of nuance and sophistication around the the situation you very quickly will look like a fool and it's and actually some people can get sucked in that way because they're like oh well maybe i don't know i was like well and then you start you start kind of like getting lured in you know um it's i don't want to get too much in a dub you know a little dovetail but it's very similar a lot of people have never actually most people who have most people who are probably listening to this have never actually encountered a real muslim they may have encountered like a buddy who's like, you know, forgive all, the, I'm going to get all the hate mail, forgive me if I offend anyone, whatever. But um, they've usually encountered someone who's like, um, they're, you know, they're Persian from Iran or someplace like that, which that's, that's why I was, I'm very familiar with that. Like Persians, you know, per, Muslim Persians who are just very nominal, like, oh, you know, it's just my culture, blah, blah, blah. When you really encounter, when you encounter like a devout Muslim, you have to really watch out because they will say like, oh, you know, well, I have, I have a reverence for, for Mary and for Jesus too. I have to be, to be a good Muslim. And they're like, what? 
And then at once, once you don't understand that, then now you're open and they can start pulling you in and, and really giving you the dance. It's the same thing with, with any, any type of Hindu subsect that I've run into kind of intimately. It's like, you really have to kind of like know some idea of, of what you're talking about um, or just avoid it at all because it could be really, it could really, you could become twisted up very quickly, very easily, you know? Well, there's yeah, this, yeah. it father, this kind of goes to like, I, I've, and for some reason I've been, it's, maybe it's not, maybe it's because this conversation was meant to be had, but it's like certainly something that I've, that has stuck out to me is that I'm hearing from people a lot in my circle is like this question of like, well, aren't we all, isn't ever, aren't all faiths or aren't all religions or traditions, aren't they all looking for the same ultimate thing? Like, so can't we like, yeah, you're saying, but is that the only way? Like, can't, isn't the God of Abraham like the same as the God of the Buddhists or like it's one God, right? So can't we all get to it? Like, so I, like, what is the, what is the, what is the priestly, uh, answer like i know for, for me i've tried to stay away from that like theological question and i've been like look I, i'm not going to get into the theology of that it's like i've tried a lot of different in my this is the way like i have there, there's no question mm -hmm. my experience is this is the way mm -hmm. i can't tell you more than that right like yeah. i could tell you this is it but yeah what's the priest's answer to that yeah theology? i mean let me let me let me try to do even better than that and then because i'm i'm not um i'm like a low grade priest you know <laughs> like i'm not that great of a priest um but i think the best way to answer it is to answer it in in our context which is leaning into what we're doing here right which is um the reality is that if you are genuinely going for it, you'll see. You know, you like, I'm I'm so I'm all in. I'm hedging my bets. If you, if you are actually going for it, and you're and you are saying with with authenticity, I'm willing to be wrong. And you actually go in it with some humility and and really say, okay, well, if this is the thing, then let's see, right? then you'll know. And, and that's part of the problem is that all the other ways of trying to approach it of kind of doctrinal, doctrinal sword fighting, it's very difficult because people are invested emotionally, all these, all these areas have been committed. And the thing with doctrine, and I mean, honestly, doctrine and dogma is that that investment, you can't, you can't circumvent that for someone unless they're willing to actually say, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to be wrong because I, I desire truth that much. Very few people are there. And most people who are there, they've already had an experience to begin to really get them to start questioning kind of like where they're at and um, in, in that, in that kind of system or that allegiance, you know? Um, so that's, I mean, I don't know if that's answering the question really, but that's, that's. They're beyond graphs and numbers at a certain point. Like, they're on beyond, I mean, yeah. And, and I think that's, that's kind of like where we're at. And, and that's the, that's the soup we're swimming in right now, at least with this kind of like work, our audience, whatever, like, we're not really trying to hit it at like obviously like any academic level or anything like that but it's just experience okay what's the experience of this and how does that experience bear out and i think ultimately that far supersedes any academic approach anyways to be honest with you because at the end of the day part of what tangles people up um like there's these people who leave the faith i mean there's this guy he's making the rounds right now on the internet who was a, you know, quote unquote, you know, former priest, which, you know, I roll my eyes at that, but he returned to evangelicalism and, you know, he's trying to make the rounds and everything. And I'm like, well, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, this is exactly what it is. You know, it's this 
academic scholastic approach to to Christ and to the church it's like well yeah I mean if that's what you're going for then you, you know your shelf life is pretty evident to me because it's, it's not going to um charts and graphs dates you know and and dates won't aren't going to hold you they just won't right they can't um and you have to come to a, a real experience of, of Christ. And that's part of the problem is that when we say this, I mean, you know, I guess we're kind of like a one trick pony here, but it's like, it really is about Christ. It's coming, it's coming back to a real experience of Christ. So like the big thing is how do you get that experience of Christ, right? Like, and I think this is the thing where um, praxis um, is, is huge because Praxis for a person like Nikolai, um, the overlap can be problematic. It can be tough, but the overlap is actually part of the thing that can pull you out of it. Because when you- The overlap of what, Father? Praxis. The overlap of um, those things that he had or would have enjoyed that would have uplifted him, you know, whatever kind of like, adjective and verb we want to apply to it that would have brought him to this place of spirituality if it if it was valid as a Hare Krishna it'll be it'll be valid in some sense or to a lesser degree but uh in orthodoxy right would you would you say like that maybe that could be because you're getting at something that I've been trying to articulate for myself uh like maybe something like spiritual tech technique like spiritual mm. technology or technique that like medit if it's meditation or Pr principles let's say principles, principles. okay principles. There's, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's there's principles there's spiritual principles that are universal because of god mm -hmm. yeah. and and yeah. you can encounter them outside of orthodoxy for sure and this is where people get hung up because people will err on the other side and be like no 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 and and those people this is the overall path, right? So the people that you that really stumble here are people who are like pretty much on the right right side of the path, right? Um, and we will probably end up talking a lot about the right side tonight because they really miss it on this, right? And they miss it of their because of their fear, right? They become so myopic mm -hmm. and they're so unsure of themselves. It's this kind of overcorrection where they're afraid that any allowance of people encountering God outside the tradition, therefore invalidates everything the church says. And that comes from a, a disposition that comes from a, a disposition and a position to be frank of, of lack of faith and, and really lack of, <clears throat> lack of experience, right? So you're saying that, I'm sorry, if they encounter God outside the church, then that invalidates their experience within the church? Is that- No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, People who tend to be on the right, right? Okay. So royal path, the middle narrow road, right? People who tend to be erring on the right side, right? They tend to refuse to give any sort of acquiescence, any sort of, you know, acknowledgement that people can have an experience of God that's valid outside of the parameters of the church. Gotcha. And that comes from a lack of experience that comes from a sense of fear, a, an insecurity, right? Um, because the need to make, the need to, to cram God in certain parameters out of your own kind of like fear, that, that's where that comes from, right? But I, I would give you an example, right? St. Herman dealing with the indigenous people uh, in Alaska, you know, they would have this, this tradition of um, opening their mouth uh, to receive the, the rays of the sun from the east, right? And he's like, oh, you know, great. Eucharist. Christ, <laughs> the Eucharist, right? He like, and we can, you can say the same for the Slavs, for everyone else. Like no one, <laughs> no one came out of, no one was, was birthed into the, no nation was birthed in the church whole, right? Um, and, and this is how just Christ meets 
individuals anyways, and he does the same with nations. He, he looks and he says to Andrew, I can, I can baptize, you know, your love of, of mythology and narrative via comic books. I can baptize that because I can, I can use that predilection of yours to, to, to see me, to find me, to, I can speak to you through that. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that tendency to, you know, whatever, torture rabbits, that's got to go. You know what I mean? Like that's, (laughs) that's, that's no good. That's That's, no good. That's no good. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with nations, right? Not everything of the Rus was, was, had, could be retained. Much of it could not. Not everything of, you know, ancient Greek, uh, the Hellenic culture could be retained. Most of it was, but not all of it could be, right? This is the same thing on, on the, on the kind of like micro and macro, right? Um, and that's, that's kind of what I, does, that's what I mean. Does that clarify that? Yeah, and, and, and so we're saying that the people on the right, this is actually like, this is this is really deep, and so I want to be sure that it's like articulated because, uh, and and it's, so I'm glad Nikolai Nikolai is here because like, I know there are certain evangelicals who are like, if they were to, it's almost like they would go through all the other, let's say spiritual traditions. I'm saying that for ease here. Right, mm-hmm. not for precision, but for ease. Mm-hmm. Those are like they would go through all of world spirituality. They would look at every practice, and if they saw any practice in there, they were like, "We cannot do anything even close to it," because mm-hmm. were we to do that, mm-hmm. where it's and it, it it almost feels a little bit like um, like the Barlamian controversy over like mm-hmm. Hesychasm, mm-hmm. you know, to where it's like, "Ooh, what is this thing?" Mm-hmm. that these people are doing that seems like mm-hmm. it's from somewhere else right. it can't right. possibly be related to god right. it can't get them closer right. to god right right and it and, and so the thing is is like it becomes really problematic especially now in our time because on the one hand you have to be and and i i mean this in a very kind of clinical i'm not i'm not just throwing out like some kind of pejorative statement but like you have to be certain segments of especially evangelical culture is just are they're they are so ignorant. I mean, they they're truly, truly ignorant of, of Christianity, right? And this is why they they lose their minds over things like incense, you know, iconography. Well, it's like um this bleeds over into some orthodox where it's just like, I try, you know, when you start understanding the development, not the innovation, but the development of, of the iconographic tradition within the church, like you have to start at Theu, like you have to start at these Theu portraits. Anyone who says otherwise is just, is just you're in denial. Like there, there is a development there, just like there is a development out of Judaism, right? I mean, that's, that's just the reality. And, I, and this, this refusal to acknowledge these things out of this, this very fearful ignorance, it's problematic because what you end up doing is cutting yourself off from, from some very valuable experiences, some very valuable um, aspects of truth, some very valuable means by which you can encounter God um, profoundly. Namely, uh, for, a lot of, for a lot of evangelicals, it's the sacraments right? They, it, <laughs> you can only go so far encountering God outside the sacraments. Full stop, yes. period, point blank, right? So just for anyone who's hearing this, it's like, don't worry, I'm not falling over to the left and saying that it's all equal. I'm not. There, there, is, there is a strong wall and, and there's a wall you cannot scale, period. There's nothing you can do. Right. Um, the worst, most terrible, unfaithful Orthodox Christian has still had a better opportunity because of that access to the sacraments. That I know that doesn't play well in people's ears. That sounds unfair. That sounds unjust. But the fact of the matter is, is the sacraments, there's a there is a not just a barrier, but there's a bridge 
to God through the sacraments that you can't, you can't circumvent outside of, you can't circumvent that chasm outside the sacraments, right? That's a hard thing for people to hear, you know, but the other side of it is, woe unto you partaking of those sacraments unworthily because it, it, it goes both ways. It's a very, yeah. it's a very real thing, you know? Um, so, I mean, Nikolai, that's- Nikolai, I have a question for Nikolai. Nikolai, like on this, on this subject, I, we, I, we've all, we've all talked and every Orthodox convert that I've had any sort of a conversation with has universally, it's all been like, it's, there's been a discussion of experience that something happened. Christ did something in their life. And it was just like prof- true for me, like just profound, undeniable. Okay. I'm in like, that's, <laughs> this is it. Did you, you were in this temple for that long. I'm going to, ass- I don't want to assume, and I'll let you tell the story of what, what happened in terms of your relationship with Christ, but did you have spiritual, profound spiritual experiences during your time in the temple? And can you like contrast whatever experiences you've had in the church versus, versus that? I'm, I'm curious to know, because I think it goes to this sort of like the overlap in, I used the wrong thing, te- techni, but it's like the overlap. Yeah. Like I'm interested yeah. to know where the overlap is with like Krishna consciousness and all of that. Well, the, like one overlap could be a general, like kind of longing for God, you know, a, a longing for truth and longing to want to be, you know, in connection with God for sure. Um, but um, yeah, I, certainly I've had experience, but the, 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 the thing that really kind of came to a head was that there was a point where I realized that what I was searching in the, in the temple was predominantly emotional sentiment okay. uh, because I was, I was a, I was a singer. I was a Kirtan singer. You guys have heard of Kirtan. It's like, everybody knows Hare Krishna's dancing around the streets and dancing at the airports and stuff. So we used to do that at the temple. So I was big into singing and it was, it was, it was my spiritual practice. And um, it was a longing, but, there, there was a very clear point where I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking endorphins and I'm, and this isn't spiritual. This is, this is like overly saturated, you know, it's like a, it's like, it's like coffee with way too much sugar. You know, it's like, this isn't, this isn't spiritual. This is emotional. Um, and, you know, so that, I guess that gets back to the element that's like, yeah, there's elements in other traditions. There's other there's elements where you can kind of see a glimmer of Christ, but you have to scratch the surface a little bit, and and then you start to see how things are dramatically different. For example, you could just say like um, the 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 Hare Krishnas pride themselves on being monotheistic within the Hindu tradition. So Hinduism, as we know it, is 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 essentially a geographical term. It's a it's 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 the peoples of India, and there's all kinds of different practices. But you can really kind of break it down to two, um, and that, that's you know Vedanta and monotheistic tendencies. So you have monotheistic tendencies, and then you have this idea of like God is like a sort of like a Jedi force, an impersonal Jedi force. And so the Hare Krishnas would have, have historically taken stances against that and said that God is a person. Um, and that person being Vishnu or Krishna, because the Vaishnav tradition is what the Hare Krishnas are. Um, so the practice is, you know, here's another, here's another commonality. A prayer rope, you know, something called a mala. And you count, you know, beads or not knots, but you count beads. So there's an element there of prayer. Um, but obviously the, the, the great distinction is what you're praying to. Um, so so it, it, uh, externally it may look, you know, externally it'll look different, but there are similarities. But yeah, you kind of have to get back. You have to get into this. So 
just 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 to bring it to like Krishna. Like, should we should we go to Krishna? <laughs> should we talk about that? Because that's Let's that's, talk that's, about that's Krishna. important. Yeah, so that's an important idea. So Krishna is said to have lived or, or essentially descended onto the earth. And uh, this was what is usually said about 5,000 years ago. And when he came, he came with his entourage from heaven, essentially, with all his people that eternally exist in the world. And what he did was he, 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 he absorbed himself in himself in whatever he does there so for the world to see and it was written down in texts like the Puranas um, and, and the Bhagavad Purana and these kinds of texts that are coming from India so the the idea is that Krishna is is the central focus of devotion that all worlds emanate from him and so um, you know that sounds very familiar right you, you can see that that's, there's some serious familiarity um, there. But really, this isn't spoken of too much, but really there's, an, there's something that you hear in, in, in the Hare Krishna world is that um, they like to say uh, uh, angels fear, uh, what is it, uh, what is the treading, um, uh, uh, Something about where, anyways, where, like like uh, where angels fear to tread, like yeah. something you know, like don't don't go too quick into like the the essential, it's like what's really going on with Krishna and like his people. There's this kind of like you know, don't read the actual pastimes too much of what Krishna is doing because you're not purified enough to know that kind of stuff. Well, of course, what does that make you do? It makes you want to know because if you're dedicating your life to this thing and they say don't look there that's weird so all you have to do is look there and you start to see that krishna is is really it's a highly sexual thing that he's got women around him and he's got women that leave their husbands to go find him in the forest and they frolic all night together And the women don't, they hide it from there. He's got, uh, you know, boyfriends too that he plays with during the day. But really the pinnacle is this idea that the ultimate love of God is kind of, it is, uh, it's, it, it's typified in this relationship of this kind of conjugal uh, connection between his women devotees and himself. And so that gets real immoral, real quick, real kind of lusty. And so it, it's, it's um, you can't help if you know that and, and you exemplify that in your, in your core as a devotee of Krishna, you are, you're entering into a pretty um, uh, dangerous place in trying to connect with God in, in that kind of way. And if you really look at the society of the Krishna devotees, you see like the monks, the like the 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 the, the sannyasis who have like taken lifelong vows of celibacy, and they have disciples and stuff. They fall left and right. They don't last very long. They end up having problems with their young female disciples. Like, how can you not? If your if your ideal is to connect essentially to visualize in the ultimate sense that you're a woman connecting to Krishna in the, in the, you know. And, and again, if you go to a Hare Krishna temple, any of you who like might go to a temple, you're not gonna hear this stuff, but like you just have to dig a little bit and be into it uh, for a while to know that things are, <laughs> they get weird real quick. <laughs> this is but, a line um, on, on Hindu gurus in general though, isn't it? That it's like, Oh yeah, they're sex fiends. This is, I mean, this, <laughs> yeah. this seems to yeah. be like whenever there's a scandal, whether it's Bikram with the yoga or whether it doesn't matter who it is, it's like, 
Ravi Shankar. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh, you you don't need to. Oh, you don't need to tell yeah. me. Oh, there's a scandal about this guy. Yeah. You don't need to tell me. Yeah. It's about his young devotees, and he's sleeping with them all, right? And yeah. it's like, yep, yeah. that's it. How'd you guess? <laughs> Well, yeah, well, you know, what doesn't exist in a, in a tradition is confession and repentance, you know, like, like, of course, there's talk of humility, you know, spiritual development and being humble, but it, there, there's no way to put it into practice. So for the majority of people, like if you are told that you are supposed to be celibate and you, you screw up. Uh, my experience is, is that most people hold it in and live a life of guilt and because there's no, there's no, there's no, where, where are you going to put it? You know, where are you going to put it? And so, you know, that's a problem. So uh, coming to Christ, you know, it's like you, you, you see the fulfillment in Christ, but you you know, it's like, there's, you can't, you can't enter, you can't enter this whole thing within orthodoxy without at least an inkling of humility. And that was a thing for me was when I first came to orthodoxy, going to the church is people saying that I'm broken. And I felt this sense of relief, like, oh, I don't have to be pure. Like, you know, like you're called to be pure, but like the reality is we're broken and you need to repent because of your brokenness and you're probably going to keep being broken over and over <laughs> and over and there's a place to put that there's a there's a there's there's something to do about it rather than just chant your way out of it it's very liberating sense. it's very yeah. it's like it's it's free it's actual freedom yeah yeah it's actual freedom father what about like yeah it brings up a good point about confession and the fact that like if we're we, we were to talk about those same it's interesting that those same let's say christian nominally christian groups mm -hmm. that are like it's as you say the sacraments i think confession is the most forgotten sacrament among all of them and i would say that uh it's it's weird the it was the shock for me of the difference in Catholic, because I know there's people hearing this who are like, they're thinking like Catholic confession, yeah. right? So where they're, they're like, there's, there's this guilt aspect about it. And ooh, should I tell this priest, like, is he even worthy? And he's going to like use it. The church is going to use it against me. And there's, this, <laughs> they're collecting information and all of that. Like we haven't talked about confession on, on this show, but I know there's some yeah. people that don't, it would be good to talk about yeah. it now, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't think... done it. <laughs> what was that? Say it again, Nikolai. Oh, I was, I, forgive me, but I just said it's because I haven't done it. You know. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that came through. Is my internet slow? Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I think um, for me right now, one of the most important things to say is people really understand too that. Um, talking about overlap again, there's an overlap between um, clinical therapy <laughs> and confession, but, you know, it's like therapy, a therapist and confession, they'll kind of like rise at the same point, they'll meet certain things, but, you know, therapy stops here, clinical therapy and just confession just keeps, keeps going. They're not the same. They're not the same. And people can find a measure of psychological relief um, through therapy. And there's a measure of psychological relief that people will experience in confession because they are just simply the fact of sharing your guilt, sharing the things that are torturing you with another human being, that human being bearing witness to your, your suffering. Um, it's built into us that there's that that is a kind of a bleeding out a, a, a pressure release valve just yeah that, that's one of those principles like across the board everyone would can acknowledge that um but what they don't know and they don't realize is that confession is there's a couple of things confession is the place where um 
the, the guilt is the easiest thing to do, which is that's, but it's also really kind of like the second to last stop with, with therapy, which is therapy will relieve your guilt if you're lucky. And if you're really, really lucky, it'll give you somebody to blame for what happened to you. Uh, it'll give you some sort of means to maybe understand why you do the things you do, why you feel the way you do, maybe, but it can never bring you to a place of really healing from those things. It can maybe get you to a place of a, a measure of cessation of certain behaviors, but it can't actually heal these, these spiritual wounds. And that's where confession um, <laughs> starts to really take off. But confession isn't just that. Confession is the means by building virtue as well. And because that's repentance. Repentance isn't just stopping a behavior. It's actually stopping a behavior and then pursuing uh, virtue. And so confession becomes a place where um, the purification process isn't simply this kind of like stark, brutal, being laid bare, naked, you know, in a psychic sense, you know, it, it becomes a place where um, the necessary cleaning of a wound begins, but also to the suturing, the kind of bandaging, all those, those things to help you mend, to now actually begin to heal and to begin that process of not simply getting back to where you were, but becoming stronger. That's the thing that people always miss out on because one of the things I wish people would understand, and I, I you know, you guys would understand this as my, as my, you know, Oh yeah, spiritual. as my guys, but there you go. All yeah, right. it's like <laughs> all yeah. my guys here. But <laughs> but the the thing is, is like I I don't want people staying in this place of just everything's about healing. Everything's about healing. It's, you know, it's like orthodoxy isn't about some giant psychotherapy, you know, kind of like therapy session. Like like you can get to a place where you move past your wounds. It's possible. Mm -hmm. And actually start moving on to virtue, start moving on to, you know, purification. The next step is illumination and God willing deification, right? But for so many people, and this is one of the problems with this uh, stranglehold that the kind of institution of, of mental health and quote unquote and psychology has on people um, is that it, it keeps them in this place of victim, of victimization, you know? And I would and I would say you find this phenomena with with people in various religious contexts too, right? It's like if you can keep someone, you know, coming back for the medicine, well then you know you're never out of a job to some degree. And the thing about you know being a confessor is, man, if I can just get people to let go of the way that they've been hurt and, and the ways that they're experiencing hurt, which is, you know, forgiveness, repentance, that's a good day. Because from there, they can become who they're truly meant to be and, and more, and, and, and more than that, you know, they can begin to actually enter and, per, and partake of the life of Christ. That is what confession does for, for a person who's participating in it, um, you know, all cylinders firing away, you know. I had just want to get something on the record. So victimhood is bad. I just yeah. want to hear it. Just like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's yeah. a like say like a a a sallow mire of a swamp that just keeps <laughs> you like self indulging all the time, and yeah. the like the the pursuit of joy, air quotes, and like finding ways to like just continue to keep the center of attention on yourself yeah yeah it's, it's really bad and and right now especially you know there's um and i get this you know because it's, it's one of those things where you know I, I spent a season in it you know and just my own kind of repentance and correction of things but just like there is overlap with you have to understand there's a there's a an aspect of you know um you know, the, 
the sacrifice, the offering, the victim, you know what I mean? The sacrificial lamb being the victim, like that that's present in it. But the thing is, is that cannot be the sole focus because if that becomes the sole focus, then you begin to cut off the most, you know, glorious part, which is the resurrection. Yeah. Victimhood keeps you forever in the grave. Yeah. Right. Forever in the grave. And that's, um, and anything that would have you focus in on that, that that's demonic because it puts you in a place of despair. Right. Well, that's the church of woke. The, yeah. The deification of the victim. Yeah. That's yeah. 100% of the, woke. that's, that's, that's the wokes. They worship, yeah. they worship the victim. Everybody yeah. wants to be like this, that thus the desire for, Oh, how can I be marginal? How can I label myself as a marginalized victim in one way or another? So that, because in that way I can be deified. Right. I'm like, I need to, I got to pump the brakes on this conversation a little bit. I'm getting a little <laughs> bit worked up. Like I was talking to father not too long ago about this, that, uh, I, the field I work in, I, I talk with a lot of people about their problems and, um, it's not at all how I thought it was going to be. And, uh, the other day I was talking to a guy on the phone and, uh, long story short, he's, he's whatever, but he was talking to me and he was said, I was just triggered because I have PTSD. Cause when I grew, was growing up, nobody realized I had autism and like, I, I literally, I had to like, it was on speakerphone. I had to like stand up and like kind of rub my head just a little bit. Not because none of those things are real. That's not what I'm saying is as I'm talking to this guy for 20 minutes, I'm not getting a lick of autism from him whatsoever. He's keeping up every conversation. And I even asked him, this is the last thing I'll say about this, but I even asked him in the top five things that you identify yourself by, where is autism? And he said, it's probably number three. And I was like, really? I'm an alcoholic. And that's maybe number five. And I guarantee that it's far more detrimental to me than autism is. And it's not apples. I mean, it's not one to one. It's apples to oranges. It's a different type of thing. But like this disability, this disability, again, quote unquote, um, is not Un- some- undiagnosed. By the way, it's always undi- it's always undiagnosed. It is no, 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 no. It's diagnosed. The thing is, is everything is diagnosed. Like, like, like social workers, everyone gets like a quarter of like flip to them every time they give a diagnosis out. Everybody gets a diagnosis. You get a diagnosis. You get a diagnosis, and it's whatever you want it to be. And so, like again, to continue on that conversation, borderline personality disorder. When it's real, it's real. But the problem is, is one out of a hundred maybe one out of a hundred and the people who have borderline personality disorder i was in a relationship with somebody who i'm pretty sure had borderline personality disorder and this person could barely function like honestly the people who really have borderline personality Mm -hmm. disorder you like you meet them you know never mind you spend time around them and it's like (gasps) Like, oh, like, what is this? Like, you got to be, I I mean, I was, that was because I was in a place where I was like, I was really on the left-hand path. So I was seeking out those, I was seeking out the demonic at that time, you know, to bring it into my orbit, to like have that energy. And it was like, I didn't know she was borderline personality, but I knew that she was infested with demons. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, (laughs) you, and when you, and when you meet somebody who's a real borderline personality disorder, you're dealing with the demon. Bingo. Like Bingo. It's, it, yeah. you will Bingo. see the demon is pop out of it. Equ- is that the missing variable from the equation, Father? It's the missing variable from the equation. The other, the other thing is, by the way, I mean, we could do a whole thing on this. It's absolutely the missing variable from the equation. Um, which, man, this spins us into a whole nother thing about the the camouflage that's used because of mental health diagnosis and everything. It's crazy, but. The thing I want to really want to hit real quick before I forget it is one of the key things about what you're talking about with um, this situation that you're describing, Andrew, and that we've all experienced, and that most people who are probably listening to us will just be going, yeah, I get frustrated about is, for me, and I, and I think this is the thing, this is kind of like a bullseye, I could be wrong, but for me it really is, um, 
it's fundamentally absolving people of responsibility. Yes. And and that that is that's that piece of you that feels that just feels so repugnant, right? It's like it's absolving people responsibility. And that's one of the really things that that's also forgive me for being redundant, but that's what's really repugnant about the woke thing right now is that it, it's fundamentally seeking to absolve people of responsibility. So the great tragedy and, and kind of like irony there is that like um, whatever marginalized group the the left, the woke is, is championing, it actually, they, they are more oppressive <laughs> to that marginalized group than, you know, whatever finger pointing they want to point at to like people, you know, on the right, Trumpers, conservatives, whatever, because they fundamentally undermine the personhood the the freedom um because that that's you can't have responsibility without having personhood you can't have responsibility without freedom right and so when you come in you're like oh those poor those poor blacks <laughs> they can't do anything let us come in and save them yeah. right they don't like it, it's the it's the soft bigotry of low expectation which is which is the worst right which is the absolute worst. It's way more pernicious than, you know, the guy who just, you know, he don't know me, he's scared of me, but you know, he'll at least take me, take me on an even playing field. Like I'll take that any day versus, you know, the the woke, liberal, left, safe, like let me do this for your safety. That fundamentally leads you into some weird type of um you know, it, it, it's it's it, it, it's that weird. It's a very weird, almost like uh, incestuous molesting. It's you feel very dirty in it. Mm -hmm. You're you you it, you always walk away with the sense of you don't really care about these people that you're. Chan I mean, you see what I'm saying. And and what you're doing fundamentally is is you're hurting them. You're taking away their person and their freedom, like I said. So I think I think this is really important to, to point out because everything that we're looking at is heading us in this direction. And a lot of us see it, but it's like the, the car wreck in slow mo, there's like nothing you can do about it. But I think part of the reason why we're having such a problem with it is people haven't identified this aspect of it. So when people try to engage, again, rural path, right? When you try to engage people who are really, let, let's just say, Right. Let's just say you got a, a, a friend who's a good person, quote unquote, whatever that means. Right. Let's go even let's let's put some more chips in the pot. Right. So a good friend is a Christian or even Orthodox Christian. Right. And they're like, yeah. And they just see that the wokiness is the ultimate expression of Christian yeah. love and Orthodox spirituality. It's like, no, we have to like do everything we can for those who can't and this and that and identifying. With, and I'm like, it, it, it's a very subtle and pernicious deception there. Mm -hmm. Right. And, it, and it's really important to begin to say to them, yes, but like Christ always said, do you want to be healed? <laughs> do you want to be healed? Right. Christ always invokes and, 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 and says, this is what I've given you, essentially, right? As God, Christ is God, you have choice. Do you want to be healed, right? Mm. And anything that would try to circumvent that, from my perspective, is demonic, right? And that's what the Antichrist will do. The Antichrist is doing, or your Antichrist system is like, hey, this is for your own safety. This is for your own good. Don't you want to be safe? Don't you want to be good? Don't you want to be clean? You mean you mean giving giving uh uh forcing medications on otherwise healthy people? Oh, I don't know what you're can't... talking about. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Adrian? What is that? <laughs> I mean, I'm talking. I'm saying as a principle, Father, as a principle, right? You're saying that's not. Yeah. Christ, uh, that's not following the example of Christ. <laughs> my, my. To, no, okay. <laughs> my oh my, Just you know. Checking. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, that that's the thing is, you know, and, and again, I think that person who you're speaking with, who's like the good person, 
the Christian, the Orthodox Christian, whatever, who's like, no, no, like, this is what we have to do. And like, don't you love people? Like, you know, wear a piece of cloth over your face or whatever the thing is that you need to do to demonstrate it. Um, I believe it's one of those points where if there's hope for them, this is one of those areas where God willing, they could start to kind of like begin to question things and the, the, the facade of the narrative can start to break down because, you know, I, as I'm, as I'm off to say, it's, it's a very strong statement, but you know, everyone's heard me say it a million times, but God is not a rapist. He mm -hmm. doesn't force himself on anyone. He's not going to, you know, that's not how this works. And so when you begin to present to someone, well, what you're presenting as Christian love, actually, which is that's, that's the big narrative, right? Love your neighbor. Yeah. Love your neighbor. Do this and that. Anyone who doesn't do this doesn't love their neighbor. That spirit, that sentiment is fundament fundamentally unchristian, right? Now, we could talk all day, like, I don't need to go on the other side of it, and, you know, and, and that happens, you know, people swing to the other side of it and do become callous. You know what I mean? Let us, let us not become callous, but I think fundamentally, and what I mean by callous is there's a, you know, there's a way, <laughs> there's always a way to be loving and gentle with a sleepwalker. And if you can't be loving and gentle, then leave them alone. You know what I mean? that that's kind of like my approach to some of these things it's like if you can't wake them up then just leave them be um but we have to be careful because th that temptation to want to just start like knocking heads is is that proves that that gives the that feeds the fire for those you know woke people of thinking like yeah anyone who disagrees with my sentiment they are they're trump you know they're they're callous, they're cold, they hate everyone. And you have to be careful when you're engaging people. And I don't mean tiptoeing. I don't mean saccharine at all. I'm just saying like, that's the real path. We have to always be vigilant and watch the movements of our hearts and our minds when we're engaging with people. It's like, are you really looking to give people an opportunity to, to hear you and to see how Christ has opened up your eyes on some things, or are you just looking to, to win the win the fight, right? Like that. This is, that's the other piece of it. Sorry, go ahead. That's like that part in Fahrenheit 451. I had to tell myself, as the person who's probably most recently repented of my wokiness, um, that uh, when he's like the, the, oh man, careful Montag, you were them like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I had to kind of tell myself all the time is just mm -hmm. like Montag's getting all pissed off. He's like, how, do you, how does nobody see this? And they basically check him. They're like, careful, dude, that was you like two weeks ago. So mm -hmm. let's go ahead and get off that high horse really quick. Right. Yeah. Father, there's I, like, you just really, you hit me with a really profound heuristic. And I think maybe a really profound tool just now. And it, it that why, as, as all these things, it's got a high duh factor, which makes it profound, like where you're like, duh. It seems like, like the heuristic of Christ is, and it, now it's just opened up so much of, you just opened up so much of scripture to me, like, and love your neighbor, that it's like, did they ask? Right. I think that's like a really great heuristic, right. that it's like, if you ask, I will not deny you. Mm -hmm. But if you don't ask, I'm not going to force myself on you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to force my will of right. how your life should be right. on you. Right. I'm actually going to let you suffer if right. you want to suffer, because maybe right. that's what you need to be doing right, right now. And maybe you know that. And it's interesting because like that's in Brave New World, the savage, that's actually what he says. Yeah. Like, I want to suffer. Mm -hmm. No, you don't understand. Right. Like, I want, to, I don't want, that's what the Soma is. Right. Yeah. Like, I'm seeing every single thing right now, like that, Father, it's such a profound heuristic where you say like, yeah, Christ would heal them if they asked. Right. And it's like, oh, right. Right. but he let them go on their path toward him in the way that they needed to. Right. He didn't force himself. So this is, this is something else too. I mean, 
this is the big trap. I mean, we this is getting us back to the father and people not understanding the father. It's like, what people don't know, and these are these principles, right? You can begin to know God to and understand how God works. You know, he of course he can do whatever he does, but he has these principles and he has he has a way of doing things, right? And one of those ways of doing things is the way that God judges is withdrawing himself often. It's not, it's not coming in in wrath and being like, I'm going to mess some stuff up. It's like, okay, you don't want me? Whoop, I'll withdraw myself. And you'll see that actually it was my presence that was keeping you together or giving you any sense of peace. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll withdraw, right? This is really important for people to understand because right now, um, the West, the whole world is in judgment. The whole world is in judgment right now. But the West and America in particular, right? Um, because no matter how you want to cut it, people are like, well, it's really, you know, uh, the powers, and it is the powers working through the administration. That's all true. But God, God has withdrawn and is allowing it, right? Because some of us talk a lot about this. We should, we should maybe even talk about it, you know, now. It's like, when you understand how implicit we all are with so much terrible things ha that happen, when you realize how, how, and I'm talking to us, like people who are, you know, Orthodox, God-fearing, or, or, or maybe just becoming God-fearing, when you begin to realize how much consent and implicit consent you've given, you're faced with a very profound situation. What are you going to do, right? You may not be able to do everything, but you've got to do something. And for mm -hmm. a lot of people, they won't even do that. They won't even find those little ways to say no. Those, those, those ways that are imperceptible to other people, but between you and God, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is really important because you begin to understand how profound the freedom God's given us. Like, <laughs> I don't mean this in the kind of cheesy, like, you know, I want to buy the world a Coke way. I mean it in like, you know, the fear of God way. Your actions do and can impact the world. Not just you can do good things in a, in a positive way and not just like you can impact the world in a, in a, in a, um, let's say wicked way. Not just that. I mean, you can also impact the world in a negative sense from not doing the thing that you should do, right? For you to know what is good and to not do it, that, that is sin. That's what the scripture says too. So what happens is, is as you as you enter into a greater understanding of the spiritual life in God, you begin to realize that on the one hand, you it's terrifying how much freedom you have. But on the other hand, you begin to realize you don't really have all the, let's say, options that you think you do. It's a weird paradox because, Yes, I'm free to not do anything. I'm free to do something good. I'm free to do something evil. I'm free to do those three things. But I realize to not do something, if I'm really desiring God and I'm desiring change, it isn't an option, right? And, and, and that's something that I think a lot of people are missing because it gets to this aspect of God's freedom, right? God's watching, not like a deist, not like the watchmaker who threw everything out and is just kind of like, I don't care. God's watching insofar as you're free. You're free. If you, if you want to, if you want to know me, if you want to enter into the whole of, of, of reality, you know, his being, his mother, the angels, the saints, if you want to enter into this understanding, then you have to participate and that's an act of freedom, right? That's not coercion, that, that's, you have to participate, right? This is, it's really important to, to understand this, this aspect, I think.
Well, the implications are really, really, really scary. They are. I mean, if like, I think that there's like, I kind of before us, so it actually kind of went through this whole like fatalistic, oh, well, I was going to give that guy $5, but the opportunity didn't really arise. And so I guess it must not have happened. And it never even like must not like have not meant to happen. And sure, maybe there is some element of truth to that. But then there's also like the whole ignoring of like, well, maybe if I had just rolled down the other window and like yeah. I was driving, like instead the, the free will was there. But do you remember? I, I mean, Cyprian, you brought it up a couple, couple whatever weeks ago, but like, you know, remember the interview where Jordan Peterson's like crying and he's like, the thought of Christ is terrifying. And like, I don't know exactly for him what facets of that realization were terrifying to him, but I suspect this is one of them because the ramifications of what is being implied here are terrifying. They're terrifying. And this is one of the reasons why, <laughs> this is one of the reasons why as, as an actual Christian, you have to develop faith which is trust because if you don't have it, you'll lose your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, faith isn't really there to keep you on the, on some sort of like subjective moral path. Faith is there to keep you sane. <laughs> if that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, you know what I mean? Because, and, and here's why I say that because no one is, is, is perfectly morally pure. How many saints they're at the deathbed. And they're glowing, you know, and the, their, their disciples are like, Yoranda, Yoranda, you're glowing. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I know, I haven't even begun to repent. What? You're glowing. It's like, God help me. I'm, you know what I mean? Like, like, you can say to yourself, okay, one of two things. A, number one, either those saints are super pretentious and liars, and they're, they're, which they're doing this whole thing, which is kind of more of what Nikolai's talking about. This like, well... Here's my humble stance, whatever, but I'm not really like, so either that's the case or wow, like they really are being authentic when they say that, which is that I, I always defer. Yeah, that's to probably them. the glow then is that authentic. Like it not, is. Yeah. What's yeah. the Greek word? I've been meaning to ask you this and I'm sorry. It's in the middle of the call. What's the Greek word for like humble words, like, but they're meaningless. Father, um, priest Monk Cosmos talks about them. You don't happen to know it. Do you? It's like, some greek i'll have to look it up I'll, sorry no 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 it's okay i i've been meaning to ask but that's actually been something that's been really hitting me hard recently is the um the the fake words the fake words but like then you correct them about something and then like they bite your head off like mm -hmm. they're like there's no actual humility there and so the glowing there actually being able to say like your whole soul like i haven't even begun like there's still so much and like that's probably like that actual yeah but we're not here for that we're not here for my for my opinions but like we are here for that well we are, that's exactly what we're here that. what are you talking about <laughs> not for that particular thing that's not what we're particularly here for but see remember that's what we talked about before with that experience of 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 when you experience, that's the fear of God versus the demonic fear that comes into you. Remember we talked about that. It's yeah. like the fear of God. It's like, you just see yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, like God help me. Like, right. When the demon comes, it's like, what in the world? Like it's, it's, it's completely external. Yeah. Right. And you're just like this, this thing is like terrifying me. Yeah. Right. In like a, in a harmful way. Yeah. Well, yes. And it's also wanting your worship right it's it's trying to coax it out of you whereas when you enter the presence of god and that fear that comes it's like you see yourself and it's just it's you can't help but do it right and so i i wonder i i also wonder too that these experiences like nikolai was sharing with me if you don't mind me going there he was sharing me, with me like one experience in particular which i for me you know being his confessor and just kind of like saying like, yeah, you know, I see the truth of his experience is just like, he was sharing about if with your, with your, okay, yeah. Nicola, you yeah. know, like okay. he was sharing about how uh, he was being, he's having this kind of like anxious 
fearful demonic visitation at times. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time during, a, I think you said it was a service in the, in the temple, it came to you and he's, and he says, Hey, if, okay, if this is what I'm supposed to go through God, then fine. And he's like, it disappeared just like that. Huh? Right. Is that's, that's what, that's what the situation was. Right. Yeah. It was striking. Striking. So, yeah. So, so the thing is for me, I'm like, yeah, see those, those overlaps of principle, that, that's, a, that's a principle that overlaps, right? Because they want your, they want worship. They want to extract it from you. Right. And so someone will say like, this could be mind boggling for someone, but if you understand it, it's really simple because so someone would say, well, hold on. He's not worshiping Christ. So he's worshiping a false God. So why would a demon want to interrupt that? But it's like, you don't understand. It's like, the point is for, is for that fear, that, that attention to be extracted from the person. So there is no kind of like code of ethic where he's like, well, I don't really want to like mess this up. And, you know, I don't want to mess up this good gig to not get this like sweet honey right now. It's like, they don't, that's not, that's not how that works. And in fact, let me explain it in a different way. Even now, like a baptized Orthodox Christian who's like doing the perfect thing, whoever that is, it's like that was even possible, right? But who's ever like doing the perfect thing, they'll often find themselves, they, they think they're battling, you know, a demon of lust, right? But really they don't realize that they're actually battling a demon of lust and pride because <laughs> that demon of pride has no problem getting them to have some measure of quote unquote victory over the lust, but then very quickly pull them to the right hand and be like, cause that, because it's a much juicier fruit to get someone to fall to the right hand of pride than it is the left hand of lust, right? Pride is the pride is the oh man. It's sweet. It's it's it's, the, a, it's, it's a the sweet worst. Treat. It's the oh man. Unbelievable. I remember reading a book one time and I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was something like Thoughts Determine Our Lives or something like that. But it was talking about. Uh, when you there's a six uh, a victory over a particular passion or something like that and then the the narrative that starts going through your head or the thoughts of the the voice that's in your head just starts going like well you've really come a long way yep. like let's just take a little minute to sit back and just like yep. reflect on yep. where you would have ended how that situation would have ended three or four years ago like yep. you would have ended up giving in yep. and I remember like literally the exact sentences that were being said in that book were like had been said to me it was like so it's not even you guys like are, are original like you guys are just recycling your material over and over and over again because like, we keep falling for it i mean yeah but like i mean i just wish that just a little effort or something i mean it's like and that's what i say it's just like you guys have nothing better else to do like is there nothing better for you to do right now like you could You're talking about the demons. You talking yeah. about the demons right now? I mean, like in my family. No, they're hungry. They're they're, <laughs> they're hungry, I mean, man. Attention. Yeah. You could say the same thing about a YouTuber, you know, and we should say the same thing about ourselves. <laughs> right. That it's like, or a podcaster. Right. You know, attention is the currency. That's the attention currency. is the food. You know, That's attention it. is food. That's it. That's it. That's they're after the they're after the food the same way Joe Rogan's after the food. That's it. <laughs> That's you know, it's just. <laughs> I want to get back to this whole analogy between YouTubers and demons. I'd like to get back. To <laughs> well, what is demons or influence peddlers, right? Ooh, there's so a lot what, there. There's so, a what do you call? So, there. what do you call a, a social media uh, star influencer? Influencer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. No. Wow. That's the wow. game we're playing. That's the game we're playing. All right, guys, <laughs> it's been great. I'll see you later. <laughs> 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 no i think that but i i think this is the it's funny because i've been i've been really i for one have, have thought about this and nikolai may not know this about me but like i've had a long time to think about this from my career in reality tv right so it's like i got a very long i got bathed in it it wasn't like 
I had a, an apparatus around me. It wasn't like, oh, I grew my YouTube channel and isn't this great? I've got a million people and I do this. I had like an apparatus lifting me up, you know, like have the pride, get the attention. Like there was a, the, I had the Tower of Babel, the, mm. as much as literal Tower of Babel as you could have, like hoisting me up and be like, okay, stand on this platform. Now stand on this platform, you know? And so it's like, in a way you get to be objective in that because at least you could say, well, it's not me doing it, right? At least I could say, oh, this is the network and whatnot, but still looking at it, you know? But yeah. there is, I've, this is something that I've, I, like, I've been thinking about a lot in this regard is that it's where the difference is, where the difference is. And I, it's like, I wouldn't be doing this project if it was that, but it's like, it's one thing if you are acting as a, like you, you are drawing attention to him, like in whatever way that it is, you know, whether it's in, I mean, obviously it's in, in the liturgy, it's all being the attention is clearly, I mean, everything is set up to draw attention to Christ, right? Like in every way. And it's like, it's one thing if you're drawing attention to him, but like attention for attention's sake. Mm -hmm. yeah it's very clear when someone is after attention for attention's sake like that and that's where you see the demons mm -hmm. because because like you say you're like don't you have something better to do and it's like no attention for it like why are you doing this why mm -hmm. are you trying to extract this it's not even getting you anywhere you're already like an immortal being that's going to be there that's you know what, what i mean saying. like what are you, why are you doing this? Ah, attention for mm -hmm. attention's sake. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just, it's the scorpion and the frog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. It's the scorpion yep. and the frog. Like yep. it's this, it's this age old yep. story that it's like, they're like animals, man. Yep. And it's the same reason why you look at these what influencers. Is, what is the scorpion and the frog? What is that? Scorp so scorpion, I think it's a Aesop fable. Yeah. But it's like the, the scorpion is coming, comes to a river and he's trying to get across the river. And it, the frog swims up and he, the scorpion's like, hey, frog, take me across on your back. And the frog's like, no way, listen, what's going to happen is we're going to get halfway across. You're going to sting me. We're going to go down and we're both going to die. And the scorpion says, listen, frog, dummy, if I sting you, I die. I die. Why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And the frog's like, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, get on. They get out halfway, scorpion stings him. As they're going down, frog's like, why did you sting me? We're both going to die. And scorpion says, it's, it's scorpion. just my nature. I'm yeah. a scorpion. I'm a scorpion, scorpion, dummy. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody yeah. shows you who they are, believe them. That's it, man. I mean, but and like, it, I'm sorry, Cyprian. And so it's, and so I think that there's like, that's where things have gotten out of control. Like you got to ask yourself, like, what are you after? What are you after? Like I used to ask people all the time. I, I would say, which, which would you, which would you rather have? And I would ask people this when, like, when I was at a point where like, I was self-conscious about going out. There's this Kanye lyric where he says that he can't even go to the grocery store without like a, a some, some new, I forget the exact line, some new shoes and a, a clean white tea or something like that, where I couldn't even just, if I hadn't shaved and done all this, I wouldn't even go to the grocery store because I knew I was going to get stopped and somebody was going to take a selfie. And if I looked terrible, that selfie would be up and then people would be like, look how bad he looks right here. You know what I mean? And so like, I used to ask people all the time, I'd be like, well, would you rather be famous and have no money or would you rather be rich but n nobody knows who you are. You're completely fabulously wealthy or super famous. And I used to always think that people would pick the rich and anonymous. I used to always think that. And you know what? Nine out of 10 would say I'd rather be extremely famous with no money. And I would be like, they want that attention. What do you mean? And they would say, yeah the dumbest thing to me they'd be like well if you're if you're famous you can always leverage that into wealth <laughs> and i was like you don't know anything about fame there's a lot of super 
child actors and stuff like that, man, who like everybody, you'd know them if you saw the, oh, hey, that's, I remember seeing Corey Feldman show up in like a 20 year old Nissan Pathfinder one time out, out in front of the office that I was in and it shook me <laughs> where I was like, this is probably like 2000 where I was like, that's Corey Feldman. And I was like, man, he is in a beater right now. Like, <laughs> oh, this dude's got no money. Yeah. Like, what must that be like? What must, and it was funny because he saw us all looking at him. And he had this look of shame about him. Oh, I thought he got out of this car. He was like, I still got the attention. Like, I'm cool. Oh, no, no, dude. Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) Like, he had, it was was pure shame. It was pure shame. Because he's like, they all, he knew what we were thinking. He could could imagine. Man, that's going to be so rough. And so it's like, that's attention. This is, this is where it goes. You know, that it's like. Which is, I, I just want to shift it real quick to something please, too on that in regards to, because I, I was, I'm thinking while you're talking, I'm thinking about how like Christ, this is another thing that people, I've, people don't understand this. Christ isn't saying worship me for the sake of, I want you to worship me. That's, that's something people don't really understand, right? Christ is like, come to me because I'm life. Like, I can't help it. Like, I created everything, right? <laughs> I, I am the source of life. Come to me for your sake. That, that's what people miss. He's saying, come to me for your sake, that you would have life in you, that you would live and, and, and you would experience what it is to be whole. That's, that's the difference. And the other thing, uh, the other kind of like point to that is, and I, I'm curious to see what Nikolai would think about this, but it seems to me, so my experience with searching and my experience with um, spiritual beings is that there was always this something behind the mask. There was always like, oh, this is what you really are. Okay, All right? The thing that's what's interesting about Christ is it's it's kind of like the um, there is this straw man, this facade that the devils, that the world wants to throw up over Christ. But but really, Christ is trying to Christ is always there, like Christ, his cross is the way that he is constantly fighting against that because like, look. You, you know me by, by the cross. It doesn't get any more like behind the mask than that, right? Like the only way to truly experience and to know me is to understand me through my death. You're not gonna know resurrection. You're not gonna know joy. You're not gonna know heaven and bliss. You're not gonna know any of that unless you taste of, of my death first, period. Whereas everything else is like, hey, become spiritually astute hey become you know you know super mystical and you know wear yoga pants and have a man bun like whatever the thing is that people look at as the kind of accoutrement like that that's always put forward right if you want to experience like i mean black hebrew israelites right be hard be aggressive know who you are racially right whatever that means right islam hey you know discipline order and and by the way eye for an eye you know what i mean like there's all these things that like you get right and so it's 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 like all there and really there is this i would imagine there's always this thing underneath the surface where you're like okay that's what i'm really dealing with and by that point you're already in right But with Christ, it's like the deeper you go, that's what undoes you. That's this experience of being your face and being like, I'm unworthy. That comes from his from his humility. That comes from, like when you encounter the humility of Christ, you, there's nothing like it. You can't handle it. Whereas everything else that I've encountered, it's quite the opposite. There's always this like, well, you got to play. Now, here's how you're going to pay. Sure. The Faustian bargain. 
It's always the Faustian bargain. Whereas yeah. Christ is like, nope, here it is all, all up front. It's death. It's pain. It's grief. <laughs> all up front. But if you, if you embrace this, I guarantee, I guarantee you wisdom, joy, peace, love, right? Because that's what I am. It's very, it's very different. I don't know if that's something similar to what some of your experience has been. I don't know if, if that's speaking too much into your experience, Nikolai, but I just, I imagine, you know. Yeah, there's a definite like embracing of your humanity with Christ versus like a transcending everything. Huh. You know, you know there's a, there's a, there's a stark difference. Like I, yeah, transhumanism. Yeah, like it, might we call it transhumanism? You, you, you're, you're, <laughs> yeah. There's a definite facing of like when you come to Christ in a real way. It's like you're faced with yourself in a very real way, you know. Uh, whereas you could go on and on and on and on in the yoga world and like think you're pretty, pretty popping, you know, pretty great. You're you're pretty you're pretty peaceful. Uh, you've got, you've got, you know, you've got the style going on and you see it like we were, we were talking the other night, probably like, like you've got your quotes, you know, you can kind of come up with some spiritual quotes. Like this is a classic thing I've seen on like Instagram, people making cool, like fuzzy quotes and putting them on a meme and putting their own name at the bottom, <laughs> like, you know, me so weird like like who does that you know but it's a deception you know it's it's such a it's an image it's an image it's a deception um and you can't get away with that with christ it's like i mean you could but you know you know what i mean like you can't get away with that <laughs> right that's right so. yeah yeah that's a that is a uh, the thing the quotes this is this when you were talking about father i've been thinking about it a lot the and and it's it i guess it hadn't been front of mind but talking about truly the difference of the words the words of god and just that and and how it's like the more the more now i now i've been looking even in the last week there's been times when different scripture has come up and i've looked and been like there's no it's just it's profound how you could never put your name on it yeah it's divine you know because it's, you're it's just divine. like i couldn't i can't come up with that i couldn't it's have the come words up of god that. it's the words of god and and i think that's i mean that's one of those things too where you know just trying to take advantage of having nikolai here with us but it's just like one of the things that i've never i this just kind of came to me but I, I'm, I'm curious you know like in regards of text, like, are you at a place where, like, do, do you sense, you know, as much as you can, don't, don't go here, but, like, here, do you sense the difference in the text and, like, hearing the words of Christ versus, you know, religious text from that you're from, from previous tradition? Do you see it? Do you, do you sense a difference or yeah yeah absolutely because there's like in the east it's like wisdom texts and it's like you know very kind of like pithy koan type stuff often um but when you when you read the words of the apostle it like when you really really kind of dive into them it's really it just kind of like digs in you know oftentimes well, uh, to be honest, oftentimes I'll read the apostle and I'll hear, I'll hear you, Father, speaking, speaking. It's like, oh, that's just what Father told me, like exactly mm -hmm. what the apostle just said. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's different. Um, there is a benefit, I don't maybe, maybe this isn't, you know, maybe this has something to do with it, maybe it doesn't, but there is a benefit. I've noticed that this idea of meditating on a pastime, like I was speaking about earlier, I've actually found that to be beneficial when I, like that kind of, 
that meditation kind of on the text and kind of absorbing yourself in the text. When I do that in the gospels and I think about Christ, like walking through Capernaum and it's, that's been beneficial is kind of bringing that over from the previous tradition and really kind of absorbing, trying to put myself in the place, you know, maybe walking with the apostles and things mm -hmm. like that. That's been mm -hmm. super, yeah, mm -hmm. super beneficial. Maybe some overlap there, but um, yeah, I think I mean honestly, uh, I think that's really valuable because one of the things that I was really struggling with when I first came to Orthodoxy, um, I found myself in a tradition uh, where the people there were were good and, and pious and everything, but they couldn't really help me make the transition. Um, and it was really important. It wasn't until someone kind of understood where I was coming from and they could be like, well, this will be helpful. This, this won't be helpful. Like definitely don't do this. You know, I think that's one of the problems. And that's one of the things that a lot of people are going to encounter and do encounter. Um, and for me personally, just as a priest, it's one of the things that I'm always uh, wanting to help people with because for me, it's like one of the greatest joys to just help someone kind of be like, hey, that this is okay. Like, like if you if you're doing this, you know, like keep doing this, you'll get some benefit because the relief that people get from that with the thought of like, okay, I do have something, right? Yeah. That, I do have something that I can work with. I do have something like to me, that's it's such a lovely, beautiful thing. And 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 I think this is kind of like, again, that just that that warning or some of that point of tension in regards of like erring to the right side, right? And it's so important right now. It's like just spending a little bit of time, like I, this this episode, whatever has been definitely for me, kind of like one of the pills I would give to someone suffering on the right right side of the path is like, mm -hmm. be very careful, you know, like you know, our, our, in our desire to quote unquote, defend the faith or quote unquote, pursue truth, um, to quote unquote, not be deceived by lies. Like that's all good. Um, but just be aware that like, there is this other tendency that can overcome you in a zeal, not according to knowledge, <laughs> or perhaps I think it's appropriate. God forgive me for not necessarily bending the expression, but maybe expounding on it and saying, and zeal not according to experience. Mm. That we have to, that I really want people to kind of like be aware of because, um, you know, be careful. You never know what God is doing with someone. Mm. And I've made this mistake too many times in my life. And God forgive me, I've probably made it even recently, you know, just getting too hopped up on coffee i'm just running my mouth or whatever it's just like oh my gosh like i worry about that like have i said something unduly you know like i don't care about offending people i that's something i'm definitely repenting of in the sense of like hurting people of what it's like hurting people i know this particular shame that you're talking about like yeah like yeah i, I don't want to like well if i'm understanding you like i don't want like I don't want to hurt people unduly. Like I don't, I don't want to be, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm like, I love people. But I'm, if you're offended by the truth, you're not, you're not going to feel bad. About yeah, 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 yeah. Truth, I don't care. But I they get offended by the truth. I don't care about that. That's good for them. That's good for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's the kind of like callous bravado of like, oh, whatever. You know what I mean? I don't, God forbid, um, when I have done that, you know, um, and, I, and I just think really not out of any type of sentimentality, but for my master's sake, that I will, God forbid, I would ever get in between him and one of his precious little ones. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a particular, that's a uh, particular, I'm sorry, Nikolai. Go ahead, go ahead. That's just a particular shame I have. I, I remember, and you know, I, in recovery, I had a sponsee, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I must have had like a really big cup of coffee, and he had a problem, and I thought I could solve it. And I just, 
here's what you need to do. And, you know, I was probably like six months sober or something like that. And uh, he came back. He's like, yeah, that was all terrible advice. Like that really blew up in my face. And I was just like, I remember sitting on the plaza and I was being like, oh my gosh, like, okay. Uh, now I can see when this breaks bad. Mm. And then I was like, so let's go ahead and and it's not like I learned from that because I still do it all the time. Like, especially with people I'm super comfortable with, like, especially people I'm ministering to, like there's a couple of people in my life that I'm really still trying to work on them the best that I can. And oftentimes I do have to just be quiet because like I can really start getting heated about some stuff. And then eventually I'm going to come to some spot where I don't know what I'm talking about. And my imagination will fill that in. And it'll be like, I'll be like, oh yeah, no, 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 this is exactly, what, but it's not that at all. It's just like, I think I know what I'm talking about and I don't know what I'm talking about. And so I'm just like, and I don't want to look stupid. So I just kind of keep going. And then at a certain point that taking that to a logical and I start making stuff up. Not, but you know, it's funny. That's what people do when they find themselves in, in these spiritual religious practices too, though. Cause I'm convinced that people encounter moments where they're like, something's not right. Something's not right, but you're already so far in, you just kind of like, well. Yeah, that's an actual yeah. phenomenon in cults. Uh, I got kind of into cults for a little while. And at a certain point, there is like a, um, what's that thing where you can gently move something and somebody won't notice until it's moved far enough? Like, like, oh, wait. Like nor normalizing or something like that? Yes, a threshold, a norm, a, a whatever that is that happens at a certain point usually about the time when the cult leader or someone says i'm going to unmarry all of you and i'm going to pick different you guys are going to get married to people who i think you should get married to and like that is a lot of times what people feel like and that's kind of how i felt towards the end of my wokiness was i was like i've already sunk so much time into this train of thought i've already worn the stupid mask for, you know, like I've already defended wearing the mask to people. I've already like ridiculed people who think that this whole thing is starting to kind of smell a little bit. So how can I pot? And then it's humility. It's, having it's to be like, like oh, how I'm many, um, how many, how many trips to get that? Like off, I'm saying this off principle, right? Like imagine that there was a situation where like you as a perfectly healthy person that like you were being required to go and they told you like, well, if you will take this medication uh, one time, then like, fine. And then like two times, then three times. And like, by the time yeah. you're at six times, then you're like, you know, I'm in like, a, this yeah. is, I know there seems about. like there's something wrong. This is, there's something might be wrong here, but you know, what do you say? Seven? Well, I've already done six. Like, what could I right. say at this point? It's like that you know, thing we're talking about. I'm, I'm saying a print. This is a hypothetical principle. Right. Right? Right. I'm not, right. Right. It's not related to anything that could ever possibly happen, but just hypothetically. Right. Right. If you were, right. if there was if this was the case, experimental, yeah, you know, if there was some talking. sort of experimental medication that was ever created. That hey, was, we're just talking. You know, we're just talking. We're, you know, we're just talking. Yeah. Uh, on it Father's might, point that like that, that that point that uh, um, noticing that there's like something that's where it was like that this is this is purely emotional like like yeah too way over emotional for me that was a that was an important point and christ can work with that you know like oh, okay because like as soon as you as soon as you start to question you like the the dominoes like happen and like everything starts to fall apart you know? um, yeah, I was I was reminded of the of the Apostle Paul, you know, going going in and and and, and actually kind of acknowledging this like this altar to the unknown God kind of mm -hmm. kind of thing. You, it 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 I think it's an important point to remember that when you're when you're dealing with people like from Far East or whatever, specifically India, you're dealing with the ancient world. It's not really it's not really anything different than what they were dealing with back then really the same it's the same you know like india's surviving pagan world you know and uh you could you know you can gain a lot from from what what they were going through at the time by looking to india for sure 
That's a really good point. I mean, that's certainly a bit more um, merciful. I think that there's a little bit more like, because I mean, yeah, the 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 temple to the unknown God, like what an approach, like what a way to like, not like, I don't know. It's like what his father said. It's like baptizing something. It was like taking a little thing from a culture, from a, from a civilization being like, this is okay. We can work with this. Like a bunch of this other stuff has got to go. But like, I mean, that's Christ. I mean, that's what he does. Well, guys, we're, I think we're coming up on two hours. What is your favorite condiment? Horseradish. Oh, thank you. Horseradish. 100%. Tapatio. Tapatio. Ooh, Tapatio. Tapatio. Wow. I'd have to say uh, tamarind chutney. Ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> little, t- little tamarindo with the chutney. <laughs> <laughs> what is yours, Andrew? Circle. It's horseradish, man. <laughs> oh, yours is horseradish too? Yeah, I love horseradish. <laughs> I feel like I feel pretty inferior for that being my thing now, though. I feel like I should go like a little bit cooler. <laughs> I'm actually actually surprised that there's three Southern Californians here and only one of us picked Tapatia. That's what I'm like actually a little shocked about that. Well, the only one, only I would have also accepted Cholula. But you know, I mean, this, this all you know the green chalupa <laughs> is unbelievable. I cannot. Okay, believe. but how many people? How many people get the chalupa for the wood top? Oh, yeah. that's the best part about it. The no, it's the worst part because then your one-year-old son sticks it in his mouth because oh. it's <laughs> on the ground and he burns his mouth really, really yeah. bad. Yeah, like, no, true. that's my absolute least favorite part of chalupa. <laughs> I, get, I get that out of my house as quick as I can. <laughs> Poor little Nikolai. He doesn't know anything. He just looks like. <laughs> oh, and then well. because I said that we do it last week, I'm not trying to do the thing because we're not talking about the 2000 next, the 2000s next week. Do you guys have three favorite albums from the 90s? Again, nothing written in stone. And people, kind of a lot of people I knew, started sending me their favorite albums, which you can keep doing that. That's fine. But I mean, you got grunge in there. You got you've got straight. mine are kind of mine are kind of obscure because they're all like they, they're all electronic because that's what i was doing at the time so uh you can all like smash mouth so uh massive attack protection which, might be, the, which might be the greatest album of all arguably the greatest album of all time uh massive attacks album. They did the house theme song and it's pretty dope for the show amazing. that's a great amazing. that's a great album list fair list fair mm-hmm uh ronnie size represent mm. i don't i don't know what i would go with i don't know what i would go with as a as a third um i don't know i don't know probably in everything but the girl probably in everything but the girl album oh yeah wow one of them they're all they're all from the 90s except for one oh, that's good yep father oh man uh Goodness. Someone to vamp for a second. I can vamp. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, my favorite body of work from the Beastie Boys <laughs> is all in the 90s. Generally. <laughs> Hello Nasty, I think, was kind of maybe early, maybe late 2000, but Ill Communication, which is their best album, in my opinion, uh, I is, right about that. Yeah, is, is absolutely in 90. Uh, is in the 90s and it sounds 90s too it sounds mm-hmm. very it embodies like a good portion of like 90s hip-hop mm-hmm. um and then i think in that vein i mean which one's the second one is it enter the wu-tang mm-hmm. the wu-tang Ooh. is i mean, it's my opinion my favorite album by them 36 chambers is awesome but i mean enter the wu-tang is absolutely incredible um and i know i just picked Hip hop, um, but oh well, then I'm gonna change my third. What what am I talking about? The chronic, the, <laughs> the chronic. chronic, yeah. That oh, would, that doctor. That's really this well with me. As I've gotten older, it's harder and harder to listen to. Don't get me wrong. Okay, all right. Lyrical <laughs> gangbang, 
Lyrical Gang Bang is one of the greatest songs of all time. Like, Lady, that, <laughs> that song got me into Lady of Rage. Like, I can get down mm. on, like, some of that stuff, but some of it's just, like, in light of who those guys ended up kind of being and stuff, it's, like, a little bit, like, Ooh, I don't know. Like, don't I'm not know. normally that guy, but. Um, oh, California. I'm Southern California, man. Look at, you know, <laughs> yeah. I got to. And I've been that listening was... to a D beat recently, so there's a plethora of hardcore punk albums that mm-hmm. I could I could really get super down on. I don't know if I could pick, pick like a particular one right now, but um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that stands out. That I'm like, yeah, this is this is what I want to throw up there. But do do you want do you want to throw in do you want to throw in Nikolai? I see Father's doing what I was doing last time. Like going through to like what what decade is? I'm this? like yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Bile, Bile by Cannibal Corpse. Because the 80s Cannibal was like boom, 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 but the 90s, I'm like, man, what was I even? Yeah, I got my third. It was Vile by Cannibal Corpse. I'll say that that album is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Some I'm like, man, that wasn't. I I'll fall into the same thing with the movies. I was like, oh, this album. I was like, oh, that was '86. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> like this album, I know that's 88. Yeah. yeah. I was going to, like, I was thinking, like, any punk stuff that I was listening to was from earlier, you know. But so if it was present, if it was 90s stuff, it would have to be all hip hop stuff for me. So, uh, uh, Mob Deep did a really great album, and I forget what it was called. It was so, but they only did, was, I think. There was too much know. good hip hop. There There's too much, too much hip hop to like really cheat. Like Black Moon was really great. Um, but um, I think Nas Illmatic yeah. uh, is a fantastic, like. They were all reasonable. It, there was too, I mean, come there's, on. There's <laughs> too much. There's. It's the golden age. Well, it's the golden age of hip hop. The whole, the the whole thing is to just talk about music. Remember, nobody's holding <laughs> these three to us at all. Like, at least anybody <laughs> reasonable is not. Obviously, like, probably Vile by Cannibal Corpse is not one of my all time favorite albums. It's just a very, very good album that came out in the 90s. It, I, I will say cool. one thing that, like, there's one album that I actually still go back to and I didn't like it in the 90s but I do like it now is there's an unplugged album that Alice in Chains did that's a really good I know that album so good he messes up a song he's like everybody gets one or something like that like he like messes (laughs) up in the middle of the set or something it's pretty uh pretty that that whole go ahead father the only two I can think of right now forgive me Jeff Buckley Grace yeah Uh, yeah i mean that's to me that just that's you know and then dope smoker or or jerusalem (laughs) depending on which release you're talking about from sleep like that's the only two i can like i don't even know what i would pick for a third to be honest with you is there any woven hand stuff in the 90s no that's all 2000 stuff but you know like 16 horsepower that okay yeah 16 horsepower folklore boom (laughs) There's there's my there's my theory. Yeah. There's know? the picks. What do you guys think of Jagged Little Pill? It's a pretty good album. I mean, the last more set is that pop yeah. out? It's a pop album. I mean, it's a <laughs> massive it's a massive seller. There's nothing wrong with pop. Are you picking? Were you picking ants? Well, no, because you picked the. I wasn't pick, yeah, I wasn't picking. Ant, I wasn't going anti pop, for sure. But I'm just saying, <laughs> like, I don't really think like the when I think '90s, I don't really think. Although there was some good popular music in the 90s, like that was considered pop then, like I don't really think of it as a pop decade. Just that's just me. It's different. And this is a different conversation we should probably have another time. But I've only really recently recognized I'm not sure I know what pop is because like I I was associated it because by the time I realized what pop was, it was like pretty electronic influenced, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm gonna tell you this. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this. The thing you gotta understand about pop is that it's much broader than the majority of people recognize it as. That's what I'm saying right now because Morrissey is considered pop, and I'm like I don't mm-hmm. get yeah. that. Like it doesn't sound like because like his songs are not verse chorus verse chorus. 
like not always well, but I, pop is pop is i don't think that pop is defined by the musical style or genre this pop is, is defined by the intent so like pop music is pop music is popular that- yeah, that is produced by the music industry. And is nine for, inch for a particular no. I mean no. it's popular. It's on an episode of The Simpsons. Yeah, but it doesn't, but it's not about how popular it is. Like, like something that's pop is specifically created to sell albums. Pop is music that's specifically okay. like that that is where an artist is found, put together into the machine, as we were talking about. Like pop comes from out of the machine. Yes. And that which is not pop can find its way into the machine mm-hmm. if it becomes popular enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. The, but it didn't start in the machine. Mm-hmm. So it's like the ultimate po- example of pop would be a boy band. Yeah. To where Michael it's like Jackson. Michael, Jackson. Michael Jackson. Jackson is legitimately the king of pop. King Whether of you pop. like him or not, that's not the point. But you can say mm-hmm. king of pop. Like he... Yes. Like On a lot of levels, not, not just king because like... His songs are good because I actually think he's overrated personally, mm-hmm. but he is the king of pop because of when you look and see being of the machine, from the machine, for the machine, by the machine, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's kind of weird because it, it's it's this weird litmus of just how bad the world is because like Michael Jackson's music isn't that great. Yeah. Like, yep. it's really not that great. Yeah. And those people end up getting like chewed up and spit out. Yeah. It's like so many of them. Michael Jackson's music is supremely well produced and engineered. Yes. And that's one yeah. thing that pop music always has is it's shiny. Yeah. It's because you have because the machine, like and being in that one of my business mentors was is is a very big producer. He produced Lion King on Broadway. He produced Hakuna Matata. You know what I mean? So it's like seeing all the people that are working behind the scenes, what wonderful artists they would have been had they not sold their souls to the machine, the engineers, the producers, where you're like, wow, you're actually an amazing musician. Like here yeah. you are in so, tucked away in some writing room studio where you're ghostwriting all of these hits for all of these bands and you've got their you know, platinum albums on the wall and you're like, oh yeah, they recorded that here. I wrote that. I played guitar on this. I did. And nobody knows who you are because you're not allowed to talk about it. Like that's pop. Mm -hmm. That's the machine. Which is interesting because pop is really about the intentional Mm -hmm. concentration of attention Mm -hmm. to the detriment of all the pieces, Mm -hmm. right? Like the players, literally, like the players slash the pieces, like they have to like sign off for no attention. Like mm-hmm. none of that attention can be diverted. It has to all be concentrated huh. with the intentional. Wow. Right? And it's interesting because the other thing about pop, like you said, is it's it's very shiny. And so that that's the biggest thing too, is that like I, I think a lot about this, like, you know, being not even intentionally like some people I guess I am guilty I, it doesn't matter I don't care but like <laughs> like I, I'm I'm that guy I just can't help it like I just for whatever reason I have very particular taste whatever and the thing that I found is and it's just it is what it is right 20 years tattooing like half of the reason some people would come is because it was the experience. And part of the experience was the music that I would play. Mm. The music that I would play would bring them into this, like, you know, Nikolai, I tell you, it's like, it brings you into the, the whole experience of, of not just where you're at and what you're doing, but what even the tattoo was, all this stuff. The thing I'm trying to get at is I would play stuff that would never and never did make it as popular music. It never could, even if you wanted to, but people would love it. What I'm trying to get at is I've, I've turned so many people on to like all these different bands that like are just so obscure and so whatever, but the music is actually, as far as you can say, objective, like it's, it's objectively good. And it's interesting to me because pop music is always 
I, I, I hear pop music and I go, and I can go like, yeah, it's just like Cyprian said, the production is what makes it, it was, is what, it was, is what brings you in. Mm -hmm. the, and the production is this weird seductive piece that it's such of the machine, like literally, right? But I think about all the stuff from like the production, like all like all the woven hand stuff, like hey, production is not that good. It's it's like yeah. it's not that good, but it's the like it almost brings the music out so much more because it's like these are just good songs, yeah. or this is just right. This is just a really great singer. It's a really great guitar player. You, you see what I mean? And it's it isn't about the attention. It's it's about the music and the experience, right? It's like the vessel, the vessel versus the context. The vessel versus the con I mean, it's I mean, pop, pop is all about the vessel. It's all about a, an empty vessel. I mean, and how many musicians get terrible when they start getting so much attention? All of them. Oh yeah, all of them. All of them. All of them. It's <laughs> there's Unless not your name's one Kendrick vessel. Lamar, because then you get you release like really really good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. I don't actually really listen to Kendrick Lamar. That was the name I reached out and grabbed because it's, I mean, it's, it's fine. It's not my, it's not really, I mean, he's fine. But um, well, do you have anything for, for uh, this week? Of course, week? I don't have anything. I never will and I never do. Um, I felt like there's one other thing I wanted to say about pop, but I can't remember what it was. That's, it's probably not that important. Um, but, uh, yeah, we have the landing page. I want to thank Nikolai for hanging out with us. Yeah. Hey, thanks, thanks. Good. We're, really we're difficult. Me, uh, lo long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> oh, nice. Man, I would have kicked myself tomorrow at some point because I would have been like, why didn't we have him say long time listener, first time caller? I'm glad you got there. I'm glad you did. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I know that... Uh, Sometimes it's hard to get a word in with us, and you know, because we we kind of get going. But um, I want to thank you for hanging out with us. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. It's real great. This is like a super pleasure. You don't need to be in Missouri to do this, so maybe we can do it again sometime. So yeah, there's like so much more to actually get into if we wanted to, you know. So Absolutely. whenever, do it. whenever. There always is. Um, thank you, Nikolai. Super appreciate it, man. Um, with that, yeah, I got nothing. That's it. Have a good night Bye. or day. <laughs>